Welcome to another beautiful morning. We're here, and boy, am I tired. Yes, it has to be said, but this is how much we love you. We come here even on a holiday like this. The streets were pretty bare, but we're here doing what we do best out of love for God and country. Of course, we get paid to do this as well. So here we are together with the crew. I'd like to salute everyone who makes this show happen every day. Sometimes the very people you don't see behind the cameras, managing the sound, managing the backroom, directing, producing, and all of that. They make it happen, not just those of us who stand in front of you. So just acknowledge that here we are doing what we do best. And if you are wondering why I am clad in black, well, today is the most solemn day for people like me, Catholics, the most important day in the theological calendar because today our salvation was won for us. We call it Good Friday, but it was not so good for the man God Jesus uh, who had to die for our sins. If you disagree with me, that's your own um, cup of tea if you like. It's not a wrangle, yeah? But I believe in Jesus. Whomever you believe in, we worship one God and we serve him uh, together. But the second reason I'm in black is because of the misleadership. I am mourning for Ghana today on the show and you'll hear me talk about that in my blunt thoughts. But what can you expect on the show today? Oh, before that. My proverb for you today, especially as the month winds um, down, we may not get the opportunity of coming back in African gear. And it is this. It's a common proverb, but with a very deep meaning. If that child learns how to wash his hands properly, he gets to sit with adults and eat. In other words, he's learned to do it properly. And so he, he merits, it is befitting that he sits with adults. It has a deeper meaning as well, implying that if we learn how to do certain things, who knows, we may even have dinner or interact with or meet people that we never expected. So whatever you do, no matter how small, don't take it for granted and think, oh, I can do it anyhow in a wishy-washy way. If it must be done, it must be done well. That's my proverb for you uh, this morning. But what can you expect in the lineup? We have the news after which uh, we'll be joined for the news review by development economist and senior lecturer at the University for Development Studies, Dr. Michael Ayamga. He is our guest, followed by sports. As always, Muftao Nabila Abdullah will be on hand for that. And when we get into our big stories after blunt thoughts, I'll be sharing my blunt thoughts with you. Three crucial issues I'm contemplating today. I'll let you know about that later on the show. But for the big stories, we have a conversation with Bole Bamboy lawmaker Yusuf Suleimana on myriad issues. Taxation in relation to non-compliance by businesses in Ghana, corruption emanating from public accounts committee sittings, and why the opposition National Democratic Congress thinks the 24-hour economy is a game uh, changer. We'll be contemplating all of uh, that. We'd also host the 2022 National Best Teacher who's on a mission to award outstanding teachers, especially those in uh, rural communities. Uh, Stella Jima Lavi will join us for breakfast uh, today on that day. We've also got other conversations coming up to inform you about events taking place this weekend here in Ghana and how you can enjoy the Easter holidays. Um, where are you going this Easter? I'd be interested in knowing. And we'd love to hear from you as well in the course of the show. Let us know what's on your mind. Let's do this for God and country. We'll be right back. Welcome to the News Belt on the AM Show. On now to our first story. In a time where political influence often comes with a hefty price tag, Professor Enoch Opukwenchi is offering a beacon of hope, proposing a path to trust and integrity in the heart of Ghana's electoral season. Speaking during the launch of a book titled Ghana's Grassroots Democracy, uh, Professor Opukwenchi said the essence of true leadership was a demonstration of trust and transparency in political campaigns. Jacqueline Ansamayabwa has more in this report. Amidst the hustle and bustle of political fervor, a new voice emerges. The Dean of Business and Communication at Academic City University College, Professor Enoch Opoku-Inchi, is championing the cause of grassroots democracy. 
With elections looming on the horizon and the specter of cash-driven politics looming large, Professor Enchi lays bare the essence of true leadership, emphasizing the importance of trust and transparency in political campaigns. Many things that I've found, why delegates take money from these leaders. I also talked to political leaders, those who are campaigning, and then they narrated that what corrupts them. So the expectations of the people corrupt these leaders. So those are where the motivation, because the leaders we could not have, we need to build them. He shared his vision for a better Ghana, one where the voices of the grassroots are not only heard, but valued. He stresses the need for policymakers to heed the lessons within the book, understanding the fundamental values that underpin a thriving democracy. The yes, policies are all based on values. So the, the book influences us to have values as a country. If we know our values, this LGBTQ+, plus wouldn't have been a problem at the Supreme Court. Because any country that knows their values stand for them. You don't even have to go to the law. And I have to explain to your audiences that the law is the least buy in any country. That is why if you are not able to clear that by, you go to jail. So reasoning and moral uprightness is more important than the law in any country. One thing is clear. Policymakers and citizens alike have the tools they need to shape a democracy that works for all. For Joy News, I am Jacqueline Ansuma Yeboa. Let's talk health now. As the Upper West Regional Director of Health, Dr. Damien Punguiri, has observed that the attrition rate of critical medical staff, especially medical doctors in the Upper West Region, continues to pose a major challenge to quality health care delivery in the region. He revealed that while 134 staff left the region last year, only 35 staff were posted to the region. Rafiq Salam reports. The 2023 Annual Health Sector Review Meeting of the Upper West Region Health Directorate was held on the team, embracing the networks of practice approach to improve health outcomes in the Upper West Region. It brought together major stakeholders in the health sector to share their successes and challenges with a view to proffering solutions to the latter. Upper West Region Director of Health Services Dr. Damien Poiri first laid bare the successes shocked under the year in review, which included the maternal and child health e tracker and the electronic medical record system, which were fully deployed in all district hospitals and sample clinics in the region. This has significantly reduced operational costs and waiting times for clients accessing health services in these hospitals. Currently, if you go to any of our hospitals, you don't need to carry your folder or lab request or anything. Even if you forget your ID card, just mention the correct name and then your uh, information will access. Dr. Damien Puiri then channel out figures of some selected indicators realized. Now, the Vice Chancellor of the Cape Coast Technical University, Professor Kweku Educhum Ayimbuache, says the university is in dire need of accommodation for his students. He's asking government to complement the university's efforts at helping them resolve the accommodation difficulties. Speaking at the graduation ceremony at the university, Professor Boache indicated that though the university had been exploring all other avenues of getting the issue resolved, government's intervention would minimize the impact of the situation on the university and its students. There's more in this report. Student accommodation is a big challenge. Vice Chancellor of the Cape Coast Technical University, Professor Kweku Ibuchum Eyimbuachi, bemoaning the accommodation situation and some stored projects in the school. The accommodation difficulties of the university, he says, continue to have a serious impact on the university. And even though the university has, over the period, made giant strides to get the accommodation difficulties resolved, government interventions would be key. Thankfully, the Governing Council has given management the permission to explore all legal means to ensure that this challenge is solved. Management is targeting, Chair, that by the next congregation next year or by the congregation of 2025, because we will have one in 2024, November, but by 2025 congregation, and I'm not a politician, at least we plan to double the available bed space by next year. Prof Chair, as for the, the stalled get fund projects such as the commercial block and the auditorium, the least said about them, the better. We continue to appeal to government to intervene quickly to complement our efforts. 
at closing the infrastructure gap. Professor Kuikubuachi mentioned some of the breakthroughs the university has had in its quest to become a giant in renewable energy in Ghana. Engineering Design and End Innovation Center has revamped the solar power tricycle with a new ion phosphate battery, thereby significantly improving the range from 5 kilometers to 130 kilometers. Simply put, this means that our now our new Echo Ride is ready for transportation to transport our students at a cheaper cost within the environs of Cape Coast. EDIC has also designed and installed Central Region's first electronic charging hub and is ready to partner government and the private sector to set up charging hubs for electric vehicles. The Department of Food Science and Technology, Post Harvest Technology, has successfully developed Ghana's first ever sanitary pad made of bamboo. And we are in the process of patenting the prototype for better production. Staying on education, now the Virginia State University in the United States has established a partnership with the University of Cape Coast with the objective of promoting joint research activities, including an exchange of faculty members and research students. The partnership uh, paves the way for both graduate and undergraduate students to visit the partner university abroad and in Ghana for research and other academic activities, including short-term cultural immersion visits, exchanges, internships, elective and uh, practical. There's more in this report. Partnerships between universities allow researchers from both institutions to access knowledge, equipment, and expertise that may be available at their home institutions. Funding opportunities are also exploited when need be for other academic activities. The MOU signed also focuses on joint teaching or supervision of students staging of joint seminars, conferences, and academic meetings, as well as special academic programs. At a brief ceremony at the International Relations Office of the University of Cape Coast to seal the agreement, the interim provost and vice president for academic affairs at the Virginia State University, Dr. Tia Menis, expressed her delight at the opportunity and noted that the MOU marked the beginning of an exciting journey of collaboration between UCC and the Virginia State University. Virginia State University's Presidential Global Leadership Program is really about, it's two part. One is providing our students an opportunity to immerse themselves in your culture, to learn about uh, the things that happen here in Ghana, to uh, gain a sense of how the world operates so that we can make them global citizens. Uh, the other part too is to learn about your institutions and allow us to figure out ways to uh, engage in partnerships that will uh, span our research, uh, student exchanges or uh, uh, initiatives that are similar at our institutions and also we want to figure out how that we how can we give back to the community um, and so part of the things that we do is also engage with the with the uh, uh, elementary uh, age uh, school students and see how we can give back to the community and so we're, we're here on a two-part mission to learn to grow but also to give back Yes, this is actually our, our third delegation to Ghana uh, with this initiative. Uh, we had one about a year ago, and I think the last one was in June, and then this would be the third group coming here. Um, we're usually led by our president, as this is one of his initiatives, uh, to truly engage uh, the people here in Ghana. We have a few students that are actually coming uh, in the next semester to study here, so we already had an existing relationship in terms of sending our students here, and this is an opportunity to expand that relationship with receiving students, receiving faculty, engaging in research initiatives, um, and there are a lot of similarities in how our institution is set up. The University of Cape Coast is hoping for more collaborative efforts and partnerships between the university and other universities to enhance overall experiences of product from the universities. And our next story, the youth of Avedaka in the Akachi North District of the Volta region are asking authorities to reconsider a decision to replace a traditional festival. Led by an opinion leader, uh, Matsolo Juwonu Zida, they have vowed to resist any attempt to replace the Amesikwe festival, which portrays the history, culture, and heritage of the Ave uh, people. Here's Fred Kwabiasari's report. The significance of that word Amesikwe lies in its celebration as a festival, and there is nothing anybody can do to eliminate or terminate the word Amesikwe from the minds of the people 
of the Avelapa community. It has become evidently clear that those whose ancestors had not been part of the exodus from Bakpa know very little or nothing at all about the word Amasipe and its significance in the lives of the people of Avelapa. That is why they think they can do away with Amasipe and replace it with something meaningless and hopeless. But they will never succeed because Amasipe can be very dangerous. The Amasipe festival can never be replaced with anything useless because the organizers want to get on with their diabolical programs. One could hear them say that they had not been getting money from the Amasipe festival. Let me, the youths have vowed to take any action. They are even ready to drop their last blood <clears throat> to prevent the Denademi Festival being celebrated instead of the Amasipe Festival. They say they don't want the Denademi Festival, but they want the Amasipe Festival. And anything short of that will, will incite them to do what they feel should be done correctly. Now, as Muslims across the world mark the month of Ramadan in a season of rising temperatures in some parts of the world, Bono East Regional Director of Health, Dr. Fred Adomako Bwating, is admonishing Muslims to increase their intake of water, particularly during their pre-dawn meals, to prevent dehydration, which can easily drain one's energy. He's been speaking with Anas Sabet, who came through with this report. The Muslim holy month of Ramadan is upon us again and people across the world are fasting as well as spending much of their time contemplating and praying. Of course, the length of time a person fasts for varies depending on where in the world they live as the length is governed by the time of year and distance one is from the equator. Before one goes on to embark on this important religious obligation, one has to first consider his or her ability to do so health-wise. Bono East Regional Director of Health Services, Dr. Fred Adamak Watin admonishes Muslims to first know their medical conditions before embarking on the dawn to dusk fast of Ramadan. We, we all know the religious or spiritual benefits of fasting. I mean, for, for some of us, because of our beliefs, uh, it's one of the cardinal things that we, we, we do as a form of worship or whatever. But Sadly, it's not everybody that can do. Uh, and we know, especially some people, some pregnant women, you don't really want them to do fasting because of the state that they are in. Some people on some medications too, because of the way and the manner in which they have to take their medicine. Obviously, you don't have to fast, but you have to know the limits. I'm not, I'm, I will not be able to prescribe who and what because if based on your condition, then there is a need for you to look for or seek a medical advice. Notwithstanding, there are a lot of benefits in terms of fasting. And then when it's been done well, your concentration is even different. Health, wise, mentally, physically, and all these. But you should know yourself. Now, even though scientific research has shown that fasting is good for your health and in terms of mental health, Ramadan fast improves mental health and depression symptoms. It is good to note that the recent change in climate which has led to a rise in temperatures in some parts of the world means heat-induced fluid loss from perspiration may lead to acute kidney injury which could lead to chronic kidney diseases in some cases. As a result, Dr. Fred Marco Barton advises Muslims to increase their intake of water before and after breaking their fasts as well as take intermittent showers in order to stay safe. The weather is not friendly. But notwithstanding, it's a vow or something that you are doing. In relation to that, uh, depending on how you do it, you know yourself. If you take maybe one bottle early before six or whatever, can you take two? I mean, these are some of the things. And even in the midst of doing them, you really want to go that far. But you can. If there are other diverse ways that you can reduce, you can shower. You have many different forms of do, do, doing this because at the end of the day, this is not somebody who say a chronic pain that you are doing. It's just a period and this is a moment, a season that will pass. And therefore, you want to take advantage of this season to get all the benefits, the benefits that you are intended. 
He however admonishes people who are having health challenges, particularly those going through extreme hydration, to take a break in order to take medical advice before continuing with their fasts. It's very important, so crucial that that is the baseline for which you will have to know yourself. If you are diabetic, hypertensive, you have to take particular drugs at some time and then you don't. Or you have to seek medical advice to do that. Reporting for Joy News, Anas Sabit, Tichiman. And on that religious note, we cap off uh, the news. But stay with us for the news review up and next. We'll be right back. Welcome back on the AM show. Time now for us to review, not the newspapers, the news. Uh, no newspapers uh, this morning, and it is common to find this, especially on a holiday like this. But of course, myriad stories that we can be able to get into, and I'll be doing that shortly with my guest. But as always, this segment is brought to you by Endpoint Homeopathic uh, Clinic. Here's what they are offering you. If you're a man, there are so many things you have to check within your system, your body. And um, if you aren't, at least get to know what's happening with your prostate, especially if you haven't reproduced yet. And they're offering you that for free, screening for free. If you're a woman, your fertility, people take it for granted, but so many things could be going on, especially if you haven't started giving birth yet. It isn't something to take for granted. So what is your fertility status again? Do you know? Which is why they are generous enough to offer you free screening on that as well. All you have to do, two options, either go to any of their branches or give them a call. Let's start with their branches. They are located here in Accra at Spintex, opposite the Shell signboard in Kumase, Kronomabwe here behind the Angel Educational Complex. There's Takradi Anaji Estate. There's Tema Community 22, Techiman Hanswa, and Esiama in Zimar. Their call lines, if you'd like to call them, are 0244-867-068 or 0274-234-321. End point homeopathic clinic, the end to chronic disease. But just the start of the news review and joining me this morning, he's a development economist. He also is a senior lecturer at the University for Development Studies. I'm talking about none other than Dr. Michael Ayamda. He joins me this morning right here as we get into the major stories. And there he is, Dr. Ayamga. Good morning. And um, it's Good Friday. Yeah, good morning, Ben. Always good to speak to you. And uh, yes, uh, Good Friday. We're anticipating a very good Easter and hoping that uh, at least he shares some light. Uh, on our year and then bring us hope as we move on. So we are all uh, raised up for it. Mm. You know, I'm Catholic, and today is a very meditative uh, day for us. Ordinarily, by now, I would have been getting ready for the stations of the cross, the communal one, and uh, others. Um, but here we are, uh, for love of God and country. Um, but I'd like to start off with basically something that is dear to you, something that is a burning issue that you'd like to talk about. I always give this opportunity. So in about one and a half minutes, two minutes, I'd like you to reflect on something you're very concerned about that you'd like to lead the way with. Over to you, Doc. Yes, uh, I think something that has struck me along the week, of course, is the uh, distribution of... Uh, uh, gadgets, let me call them tablets to secondary schools and then uh, Christian it uh, smart uh, schools. And when we see things like this, uh, they worry us because if you are somebody who follows the trends all over the world and you see how we are simplifying and trivializing very important things and issues that have implications for 
the future of this country and for the future of families, I, I get ex exceptionally and exceedingly uh, worried. Mm. Yes, it is good to give guidance to students, but to uh, belittle what uh, smart education is, or let me call it more uh, interactive uh, learning platforms are, uh, you only do a disservice uh, to this country. And you cannot follow what you are doing uh, digitization of uh, uh, secondary schools. Because before you can do that first, you have to look at the infrastructure and make sure that they are up to speed and they are uniform or almost close to uniformity across uh, schools. Secondly, you have to train the trainers. So you have to probably orientate the teachers towards digitization, let them understand. And then you have to train the students. Mm. Then you have to digitize the content to ensure that these, all these things are compatible. You have the checks and balances in them. And uh, you can actually facilitate uh, learning. Now, to just jump to the very last uh, component of digitization, which is actually giving students tablets here and there, uh, it, it worries me. And that is not how to do smart uh, education. I believe that we should be a very serious uh, nation. Uh, we cannot be a nation of slogans and uh, uh, catchy phrases. And when we start doing things, we just claim we are developed. And we did the same thing with the uh, free SHS. And when we talked, people thought we were against it. I'm not against it. I, I, my kid has a tablet. My kid has a, attends a school that uh, has these platforms. And uh, I appreciate them uh, greatly. But what they have put in there uh, is not close, uh, is way, 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 way beyond what we are doing. I have been trying to digitize our center. In fact, our center here at UTS uh, has a digital phase component. Right. And some of us, years of lessons in Moodle. So you are able to interact with the student. You know what, when a student goes online, what he's doing, how many hours he spent there, the content he reviewed. You put in content, he puts in content. So there is that interactive thing. Currently, in across our schools, we have one IT teacher that even sometimes to uh, uh, change the battery of the system or even to uh, properly charge it, everybody is going to that fellow. The rest, naturally, you don't understand anything. Then some of them have no lights. Some even don't have uh, uh, rooms to sit. And I wonder when it's today in those under trees, what they're going to do with that tablet. So you have to uh, look at uh, this and you say, let's be honest with ourselves. Nobody is against uh, digitizing education, but let's give meaning to it. Our tendency to rush for anything because there's opportunity for procurement, and then uh, we just procure and don't care about the impact of the whole program on our country's development and on the individuals is problematic. So that is where I'm, uh, I want to uh, put this in that we need to be serious with whatever we do. A catchy phrase doesn't mean that something's happening. Calling our dilapidated secondary schools without textbooks. Uh, we grossly reduce uh, teacher student content, uh, smart schools. It's only an additional insult to parents who are now known to be paying more for uh, uh, alternative forms of instruction because of the uh, challenges we are having with our education system. We just do this and call it smart school. To look at dropping all this money on tablets at this point in time, when there are other burning issues in the schools that we could uh, be addressing, I say it's problematic, it is populist, and it's a lack of critical thinking as far as development education center is concerned. Lastly, I call for a national dialogue on education. I still think we have to do this because to allow this the whims and caprices of anyone, you jump the next day and then they are bringing a policy, you don't know which plan is coming from, which program it is following. And you cannot be toying with people's words like that. That uh, 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 random uh, uh, policies that comes into anybody's mind and our kids have to follow it. They don't get the chance to do it all over again. And if you have to take such policies, such decisions, you ought to be careful and ensure that we are up to speed. What we are doing now is creating the next generation of app users, a market for uh, students who are learning, actual science and doing actual digitization elsewhere. It is problematic and I hope that we policymakers and we those at the uh, forefront of uh, uh, 
policy discourse, take these things seriously, and move away from the politicking. I am bearing the full brunt of teaching students who have not been adequately prepared to be taught. And right. uh, the more I talk about this, uh, it conveys the, 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 the passion inside me. I don't want us to fail the next generation and to fail this country. Well, thank you very much for those thoughts. I see someone uh, watching us uh, live. Uh, Princess, it's, it's been a while. It's good to see you actually connecting with us live uh, via the feed. But anyway, let me come to this. So when you go to myjoyonline.com, economy to rebound in 2024, manufacturing sector to recover strongly. That story is there. And having endured the worst economic turbulence, Ghana's economy is expected to rebound in 2024, according to IC research. Um, its inflation forecast suggests a non-linear but general decline in inflation towards the mid-teens by 2024, despite recent elevations in foreign exchange pressures. Now, the expected general disinflation outlook, it said, would sustain the recovery in the price-sensitive manufacturing sector in 2024 as a rebound to positive growth in 2023 from a contraction of 2.5% in 2022. And I'll just quote this, uh, this portion and wrap with what the report says. It says, having endured the worst of recent economic shocks with the ongoing policy adjustments, delivering modest signs of macro level improvements, we perceive favorable conditions for a rebound in economic activity in 2024. But if you look at the exchange rate, if you look at current inflation, and I'm not just talking about the figures out there because inflation is also relative depending on what you do and how you do it and what your purchases are and what your purchasing power is. Uh, you look at the, the taxes, look at everything in between, even our cocoa and how things are panning out, something I'm going to be talking about in my blunt thoughts. Uh, what is your reading? Do you subscribe to this report's conclusion that things are going to get better. And oh, lest I forget, Doomso as well, which is impacting business. Your take. Yes, Ben, you took the win out of my seat. Uh, I looked at the general uh, uh, titling of this report and they said the economy to be bound in 2024. We are in March 2024, that is the first quarter. So when they are saying 2024, what do they mean? Secondly, they haven't uh, told us what is happening in the economy. That is the source of this rebounding, why manufacturing is going to grow. And they say it's their perception. Uh, so as you said, perceptions, everybody has a, a perception. And uh, this is not a robust and scientific uh, review as far as I am concerned, because even if you are just taking a cursory look at the uh, economic uh, trajectory of most of the, uh, the trajectory of most of the economic uh, uh, fundamentals, you realize that we still have to uh, worry. There are projections that uh, we may end the year with inflation still around 27, 28 uh, percent. That is, uh, instead of going down straight, steadily and uh, uh, providing confidence and maintaining a downward uh, trend, it is currently uh, uh, sporadic going up, coming down, and uh, no real uh, expectations that can be formed regarding it. That is a, a key. You, you were talking yes. about scientific, uh, so this is what they are saying. Our optimism hinges on the ongoing investment and expansion in network infrastructure by the major telecom sector operators, while demand for data services, this is one of them, continues to grow. We also expect demand for hospitality and transport services to strengthen on the back of the upcoming election, electioneering activities in the lead up to the December uh, elections. Consequently, we believe the slowing momentum in Ghana's growth rate has bottomed out with the economy primed for a modest recovery in 2024. We thus reiterate our 2024 growth forecast range of 2.8% to 3.8% with a midpoint of 3.3%. It's concluded. Yes, that's why I have to say the, data, this, the research is not scientific one. Mm. They are all based on perceptions and not uh, real concrete data. You are talking about investment in uh, network expansion. Uh, definitely, how does that uh, tie in and to what extent is our economic growth hinged on network? That is uh, one question you, to, uh, you need to ask. And I just think that this is uh, probably mere uh, uh, conjecture. 
Christmas periods come with their own uh, uh, pressure on inflation. Uh, they come with their own uh, 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 issues on importation. So yes, you are asking, you are thinking that uh, it is possible to experience some uh, spike in maybe some sector, but that is not uh, an issue of uh, an economic rebound. You cannot describe a sporadic or a random uh, 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 movement in the economic uh, trajectory as a trend. And when you say rebound, it means something has hit the base and it is now on an upward trend. What they are talking about is a festive season and an event having a momentary impact on the economy. These are two different things. And uh, I, I don't, as a researcher myself, I don't want to uh, uh, rubbish people's efforts because uh, we know sometimes it takes uh, a lot to do this. But I think that the, the, the uh, findings here and the approach here suffers from uh, uh, thorough deficiencies in the, the methodology uh, they have applied. As I was uh, indicating, investment is key. And for any nation to grow, we, we must have a, a, a positive uh, net investment. Uh, that is fundamental. We need to invest, for example, to reduce depreciation uh, of the uh, capitals we have, and then to also increase the efficiency of the capital. We have to have a, 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 a reducing uh, capital output ratio to actually significantly uh, grow. As we are talking consistently, we have been recording the lowest, uh, some of the lowest uh, uh, capital investments, even in our budgets. So you want to ask, what is the source of uh, that growth is problematic? You already mentioned the taxes. Corporate Ghana now are facing significant uh, challenges, uh, staying afloat. And if you follow the trend, the tendency is for business to relocate to other production areas and seek to import of Ghana rather than moving here to set up the production. So on that even a basic uh, uh, thought, what is the source of that optimism? Uh, everybody can be optimistic because uh, we are patriotic. We want our country to be uh, good uh, for us to be able to afford things for our family. So right. if you achieve optimism, fine, but I don't want it to be projected as scientific evidence because the science is not in this publication as I see it. The description right. is somebody that are trying to uh, maybe please certain quarters and uh, uh, affect the discourse. But I don't think we are there. Then we need to be worried given that we have uh, exhausted a lot of the IMF uh, receipts we are expecting. Most of the uh, foreign uh, exchange receipts we are expect as far as the IMF program is concerned. They are coming in, the World Bank funds are coming in, and the exchange rate is still not uh, responding uh, the way we expect. The economy is not uh, responding the way we expect, and it's problematic. You look at this thing and you see that investors are worried that we have not been spending, and in order for us to grow, we have to spend in the right uh, areas that we have not done. There is still no room to reduce any tax for corporate Ghana. And that is why I was surprised that a uh, uh, good time of all people were jumping that they embraced uh, 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 the vice president's uh, tax plan. Uh, uh, then I'm asking, yes, if we are dealing with maybe some uh, 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 market movement, way, 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 where I'm, I was born, maybe we can understand, they don't look at that data. But you are talking of Guta, I, I, I think I think that statement is a bit unfair, especially to the likes of the president, um, uh, because I mean you, you you know of his academic prowess and all of that. I don't think they took it lightly. And to be fair to them, to be fair to them, to be fair to them, to fair to them Doc, yeah. they they um, did say that um, they were hoping that what he said he would actually execute. It no. wasn't as though they were latching onto it and saying they would want these political parties and their leaders to do things that they would want. And the mere fact that the vice president was alluding to something they were in tune with was a, was a step in the right direction. Yes, Ben, I, that's why I am saying that if it is where maybe I was born and we are looking at the small market there, the actors may jump at it. But you need to look at, I will just move away, use language of a technique. If you look at the posturing of the vice president and his actions, they are not things that 
project someone who reduces taxes when it counts his actions. His lectures are attacked with actions. His policies in implemented by the economic management team that he has led has introduced the most crippling tax in history. And okay. he is on the report to have brought in more net tax increases that they are taking away. So based on his posturing, that is a problem. Secondly, uh, you look at the imperatives. We are a nation that is looking to bring in every tax uh, CD we can get. Because you want to ask yourself, how is he going to finance those tax reductions? And that is what I expect industry players and journalists to be asking. Because there is no room. You look at the economy now, and anything that can be taxed has been overtaxed. And our tax to uh, expenditure uh, ratio is still not encouraging. We are still getting these uh, IMF uh, tranches based on, uh, uh, let me say, goodwill to a large degree. So you cannot just say he says you reduce tax. You have to ask whether it is possible to do it. And right. I don't think it is possible to do right. it because we have no financing it. Right. Once we are in taxes, we have to ask ourselves, where is the money going to come from to uh, fill the huge hole that we are going to create for these uh, revenue deficits? Right. Because then government has to spend to invest, as you rightly indicated. And those investments must be financed by receipts. We are out of the credit uh, markets, and it is unlikely we'll get back there anytime soon. Right. So if you now take this into consideration, you want to ask somebody, yes, it is good to say you reduce taxes, but looking at the framework, you yourself, your orientation, and your posturing, your actions in government, plus the imperative, the practicalities within the economy, is it possible for somebody to be saying that right. you reduce the kind of Doc, Doc, the is Doc, so we have to uh, make the, the, the interaction bite-sized so that we can also look at uh, a compound of other issues. Just something I heard you uh, say that, um, and I don't want a response on that, but I heard you say something about uh, we are even getting the tranches of the IMF money being doled out to us on the back of goodwill. There may be some goodwill. We've seen about, I mean, some of us, for example, the flying in of the IMF boss, Kristalina uh, Georgieva, uh, over a weekend to come here. Some have suggested that means things are not exactly going well. But our country has also ticked certain boxes in terms of uh, getting these sums of money. So I think it's a bit unfair when you say we are getting it uh, maybe solely or predominantly based on goodwill. But let's move away from there. Government suspends implementation of price stabilization and recovery levy on petroleum uh, products. And the story, again, on myjoyonline.com says, government has directed the National Petroleum Authority to suspend the implementation of price stabilization and recovery levy, PSRL, on price buildup on petroleum products. Now, this uh, will freeze the implementation of the levy charged on every liter of petroleum products and kilogram of LPG from Monday, April the 1st to June uh, the 30th of 2024. It was contained in the letter from the National Petroleum Authority to all the players in the oil marketing and distribution space in the country. Do you think, looking at the prices of fuel, which have been going up, inching up uh, a bit more recently, do you think this will act in any way to cushion the ordinary person, you know, uh, patronizing LPG or purchasing fuel at the pumps? Uh, briefly on that. Well, without... Uh talking about the economic implications, any opportunity to give a Ghanaian now a password is welcome. And uh, uh, I welcome the move. It's rather too late. You see, when we were calling for a review of these taxes, especially in the uh, petroleum price and, uh, formula, we wanted to form expectations. We wanted to influence, let's say, economic growth. If you do it early enough and the economy don't suffer the effect, any small decrease in, the, in petroleum prices uh, brings a significant uh, benefit because the economy is growing. Now you have reached a point where we have lost control and we want to make infinitesimal uh, changes to uh, prices of petroleum. It is not going to uh, significantly affect the uh, cost of petroleum. And now we realize that those we are working with, those in the transportation sector, respond to uh, these uh, quantum changes. So while the increments are coming in leaps and bounds because uh, the economy is uh, out of control, the sector we have lost control uh, over it. There are a whole lot of inefficiency issues that lead to uh, our inability to rightly 
pay for uh, these products that uh, we are bringing in. So there is a huge challenge to me as far as I'm concerned. As I said, I welcome it, but it is not going to bring in any needed result. That is not going to make a, a driver very happy that he goes and he gets like uh, 10, 20 pesos out of uh, four or five gallons of sleep. That is uh, rather too little, too late for me. Let's look at some other stories, and uh, I'll go to um, this one. I'll just read in passing and add it to another story I'll get into. Then I'll take your responses. Floods, and you know we're approaching that season again. Floods, we're exposed, but my team and I are, quote, running to catch up. That is Kojo Pongkroma uh, saying so. And, of course, um, works and housing in uh, the picture. But let me get into the story. Uh, the Tema General Hospital story. If a baby died, it wasn't because of Doomso. The Ghana Health Service Accra director has said so. Now, if you know the story, and it's one of the issues on the back of Doomso that I'm going to be looking at when it comes to my blunt thoughts for today. The Greater Accra Regional Director of the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Akusia Ejei Owusu Sapong, has dismissed claims a three-day-old baby died at the Tema General Hospital in the evening of Tuesday, March 26, due to a power outage. Um, she explained that investigations from the hospital confirmed a power outage on Tuesday evening, during which their generators initially functioned, but later encountered a fault that took approximately two hours to rectify. In an interview with Joy News on Thursday, that is yesterday, Dr. Wusisapon stated that uh, the hospital machines or equipment had power storage, uh, ensuring continuous treatment of patients or babies on monitors or oxygen during uh, the power outage. But... If you read the statement from the hospital, it also says the one at the NICU, the neonatal intensive care unit, started off, had a problem. It took two hours for them to rectify that situation. The Tema General Hospital in that statement confirms that no baby, at least those who were in the incubators, I hear they were very uncomfortable. Imagine them, newly born babies, incubated and having to go through you know, the system not working. Uh, none of them died per the Tema General Hospital. But here we are hearing of a death and the Great Accra, well, uh, director is saying it wasn't related to that. At least that is corroborated by the statement uh, of the Tema General Hospital. But generally, what does this do to our health setup? Because two hours is a long time. Imagine someone having surgery. 10 minutes, 20 minutes, blood gushing out, not being able to complete the procedure could mean death. Uh, your quick take on these two matters. Yeah, ben, uh, we need to be fair and very honest here. And as I said, uh, others can make that statement. If I make it, I can get away with it. Even in the midst of uh, uh, stable power supplies, uh, uh, power issues or image, that has to do with uh, either the facilities, internal systems and controls, or maybe a random uh, uh, malfunction of machines. These things uh, happen. And as we sit now, there the, the are places where the power is off, but the uh, health units are working or the, 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 the uh, baby incubators are working. So if the hospital had done its homework, well, put in the systems and balances to ensure that uh, we have uh, some backup supply, especially against the backdrop that we have doomed. So where I can blame, I can blame the doom so is the lack of clarity. You haven't told us that we are doom so. There is no time to be. And when I know there is doom so and I'm leaving, I ask my young men that how is our petrol situation? Have we checked the generator? I'm anticipating it. But when you don't, and it looks like everything is okay, people don't put in measures to uh, curtail some of these things. So that is the only reason I would say maybe Tumso might have had a role to play. That is the, the, the uh, cavalier nature of the energy ministry and uh, the uh, kind of uh, language that is being put out there doesn't uh, help anybody and doesn't help government in dealing with this issue. So I would say that uh, they need to be very clear, very uh, forthright with the Ghanaians as far as the Tumso is concerned. Right. But to blame right. this occurrence on just the alone not fair. I think that even in the midst of a stable power supply, this thing can okay. The hospital has to look at its internal systems and ensure that a place like that doesn't even only have a standby generator, but has some 
very close power supply system that somebody can just turn on to give the two systems free. Right. So and and uh, uh, that the, the 24 year old mother uh, involved uh, had a cesarean section. And um, she actually revealed that when she went to see her newborn son, a doctor told her the child, and I'm talking about the Tema General Hospital, a doctor told her the child could not survive due to the non-functioning medical equipment on the back of the power outage. So it could have been a communication issue. But on the back of that, I have seen that um, Gridco, uh, th there is a power outage um, announcement, two of them from the ECG. Tema region, uh, dated yesterday, actually, uh, where the ECG is informing customers and the general public that Gridco has reduced power uh, to their mobile uh, bulk supply point, resulting in outages in many areas. Afienya Quarries, Christ in, Christian International School, Ochebreku, uh, Okushibri, Jerusalem, Apollonia City, Kataman, so all the way to Star Steel and Dodoa uh, switching uh, station. So if you've not heard of that situation yet, the ECG is saying based on uh, Grid Coast reduced power supply to that station, the Mobole bulk supply point, all of these areas, I'm sure you can go to the website of the ECG, are going to be affected. And um, there's another one also stating, uh, also dated the 28th day of March, which is yesterday, suggesting that, um, let me quickly get to it, because of the same reduction in power supply to their smelter two bulk supply point, uh, Wanghen Cement, Goyle Bitumen Plant, Leyland Plants, uh, Leyland Paints, Oyoko Europass, Japan Motors, Mankwaze Fisheries, Ginseng, Akasanoma, and, and mind you, all these places I'm mentioning are in industry-based, so you see what's going to happen there. Medical stores, Cocoa Processing, Imani Brothers, Amandi, um, Asempa Cold Stores, all the way to Golden Jubilee Terminals Community 2, Cocoa Board Warehouse, and its environs are going to face some power challenges, which means that they may have to kick, uh, let their generators or plants kick in, which could also affect the cost of uh, whatever they produce. But very quickly, in some 30 seconds, Doc, do you have your Doomsaw timetable yet? Have you crafted yours? Yes, I have made one uh, following the advice of uh, Napo. So my young man here uh, actually programmed that every day we are going to get some two, three hours uh, deficit in power. At least, you know, mostly the news don't hit Northern Ghana too much because we are a small uh, uh, component of the power consumption. And sometimes putting lights off here doesn't actually lead to the consumption. So a lot of the places still uh, normally get some three, four, five, six hours of electricity, even in the peak of rooms. So, so I'm making uh, uh, plans for those things. But right. you see, that is the problem here. We will just read the story about uh, this uh, power uh, supply uh, reductions. And the information is not being presented as reduction. Because you see, when there's this reduction, you have to tell people, this is the cost, this is how long it's going to last. And this is what we are supposed to do uh, for the power supply situation. Mm -hmm. Now, the leaders don't want to admit that they're doing so, so they can't hold people accountable when they put off lights. So that is a chaotic situation we're having here. Yes, we need to admit that we have power supply challenges, and let's make a, a plan uh, for it. Uh, right. We used so much in the past, but this is crippling our economy. And yes, I have a of time table, and I thank uh, the Honorable uh, Matthew Kuku Prember for his planned advice that uh, we should do our own tangible. <clears throat> right. Um... There's this story, and that's how I'm going to end. Two stories, uh, not, necessary, not necessarily soliciting any responses, but that very sad situation in South Africa where a girl, eight, is the only survivor as 45 people were killed in a bus crash. And this one, President Akufuado, and I'll be celebrating him shortly. I look forward to working closely with President-elect Fai, that is Basiru Fai, uh, to enhance Ghanaian-Senegalese relations. I am so proud of that 44-year-old. and I 
honestly wish him uh, the very best. Eko Fuadu says he's um, looking forward to working with him. Any final thoughts, um, Doc, Dr. Ayamga, before you take leave of us? Today actually is the president's uh, birthday. Any words for him in less than a minute? We have to go. <clears throat> Yeah, he's a father of the nation, the grandfather. I wish him a happy birthday. I hope that uh, he stays strong so that he doesn't leave office with a lot of uh, challenges that uh, we soon have to be dealing with the uh, president, the former president, of the world and so on. So I wish him a happy birthday. I know he is overwhelmed with tasks, and uh, we cannot uh, uh, say he is not doing his best. It's just not enough. So I, I hope that uh, his last. Uh, a uh, few months in power, he sees them as a chance to turn around his legacy and begin to move away from the overly partisan and political orientation right. to a more national outlook that allows us to feel part of Ghana to okay. see national development as all of us have all responsibility. All right. uh, if he works well this last six months, I'm sure he may be able to serve his image as it is now. Uh, many people are not too optimistic and too happy with him. All right. Doc, thank you so much for joining us uh, for breakfast uh, this morning. And I've been interacting with development economist and senior lecturer at the University for Development Studies, Dr. Michael Ayamga. Of course, I'd like to wish uh, the first gentleman of the land, Nana Adodankwe Kufuado, a happy birthday. Today he turns 80. I would have wished that the circumstances in our country were different at this time. But it is his birthday. I'll reserve the bashing for my blunt thoughts. But for now, we celebrate you, Mr. President. May you live long to see a better Ghana. And uh, I'd also like to celebrate Marcia Kafui Akuto. Uh, today is your birthday. Um, you're hitting that floor, getting deeper into it. I wish you the very best in life. God bless and keep you. Before we veer into sports, this segment always brought to you courtesy of Endpoint Homeopathic Clinic. They're offering you, as always, if you're a man, Prostate screening for free. If you're a woman, fertility screening for free at any of their branches. Here in Accra, it's Pentex opposite the Shell signboard, Kumase Kronumabwe here, behind the Angel Educational Complex, Takradi Anaji State, Tema Community 22, Techiman Hanswa, and Asiyama and Zama. Their call lines 0244 867068 or 0274 234 321. End Point Homeopathic Clinic, bringing us to the end of the news review. And they say the end to chronic uh, disease. But up next, we serve you sports. Do stay. Well, thank you very much for staying with me for this holiday Good Friday installment of Blunt Thoughts. It may be the president's birthday and we've celebrated him. But right now, we discuss the hard issues that are taking place in our country. Which is why today I have titled my Blunt Thoughts, and I'll repeat the title for you. A Doomsaw Situation, Cocoa Dissipation, and Open Defecation. Wahala Every Day. A doomsaw situation, cocoa dissipation, and open defecation. Wahala, every day. Now, these are three critical areas I am looking at. Energy, cocoa, you may have followed the stories that we've been bringing you, and open defecation and everything happening in between. So let's quickly get to the slides and find out what I have to share with you. Now, starting from the standpoint of energy, yeah? In recent times, I heard the energy minister, some people allude certain or assign certain attitudes to him. You want to give everybody the benefit of the doubt, right? But the more, and the more I listen to the energy minister, the more angry, for lack of a better word, I keep getting. Because what is this? What was the rhetoric then? And why this rhetoric now? The energy minister in recent times asked about a load shedding timetable, gave us this ludicrous response. 
Ask those who want to bring it if there is. I haven't seen any timetable. The ECG says there is no timetable coming. Why do you want to bring a timetable? For what purpose? Why would somebody wake up and wish evil on the country? When it is not planned, you can't tell the person. Evil, I see. When we are talking about how to manage our lives, the energy minister says, if you want that, you are thinking evil for Ghana. Wonders will never end. But let's go to the next slide. Because in the midst of all of this, the PURC has issued an order to the ECG and given it certain timelines. I was discussing that just a few weeks ago. In fact, just last week, right? And they were told to comply with a cash waterfall mechanism and pay all tariff revenues um, by March 25th, uh, 2024. That has been dealt with. That has been tackled. It's, it's, it's ongoing, right? But then submitting a load management timetable for, in, in some context, it's not in the general context, but they had spoken about transformers and other maintenance activities. So they were told, give a load shedding timetable for some of these. That, the deadline, March the 27th, 2024, the ECG has not complied with that directive. Then the provision of evidence of publication of load management timetable. Of course, if they've not published it, they will have no such evidence. Again, March the 27th, 2024, non-compliant, as far as that is concerned. Then you look at the Tema General Hospital issue, which I've been talking about. Now it's crucial, Ghana for, because on the day, some may say, oh, nobody died, though there's that 24-year-old woman who underwent a cesarean section who says, my child died and a doctor told me that the equipment they were supposed to use could not be used because of the power outage. I'll get to that. But a power outage in any medical facility is a crisis. Because there could be people undergoing surgery. There could be people... I mean, imagine you've been opened up and the lights go off and you're bleeding. It's only a matter of time. And you may see it as far away. It could be you. It could be me. I've gone to some of our public hospitals, which is why nowadays a lot of the time I wouldn't go to any of them. And I have, I'm not discrediting them, but you know what happens when you go to some of them and how long it takes before you get any treatment. In the midst of all that, they had plants, generators, all right. But at the NICU, the neonatal intensive care unit, it wasn't functioning for about two hours. Now, this 24-year-old woman says, the doctor told her, that some equipment failed to work on the back of the power outage, and that led to the death of a child. But the Tema General Hospital came out with a statement saying that no such thing had happened, at least in the ICU or the NICU. And we've heard the Great Accra Director of the Ghana Health Service also weighed into it. But why do we have to get to this point? Power went out on Tuesday, March the 26th, and the hospital had to rely on its power plant. The generator for the neonatal intensive care uh, unit was faulty. Engineers started work. Power was out for about two hours. However, no lives were lost as a, as a result of the power outage. This is what the Tema General Hospital told us. And I think their leadership also ought to be proactive. We are in a period of doom, so let nobody deceive himself or herself. You should know that these things will happen. And especially in an area as crucial as the NICU, if you know that there's a power outage and your generator or plant is not functioning properly, what do you do? It's a matter of life and death in minutes. Now, the system peak load outlook. Follow me. There's a picture I'm going to paint. In 2022, peak load, 3,469 megawatts. 2023, 3,618 megawatts. 2024, 3,788 megawatts. You see an incremental trend, right? And it also stands to reason that once you know this is happening, what will you do? You get prepared. You provide as the population grows, as industry tries to do more. But what did we do? If you go to that next slide, right? Factors influencing the peak demand in 2024. Economic growth increased loads, notably commissioning of ongoing rural electrification initiatives within ECG and net code distribution zones. Of course, we were fully aware of all of these. 
But then you look at whether we did not even know that Doomso was going to happen. It appears if you follow the rhetoric, the incremental trend in, in power requirements and what reports said, right? The Energy Commission. It was clear that we knew we were on the verge, on the cusp of another Doomso experience. And here's why. Our installed capacity, 5,194 megawatts. Dependable capacity, 4,756 megawatts. Factoring in planned scheduled maintenance for generation units and fuel supply situation, you would realize the difference. Available capacity then would give you 4,400 megawatts. That gives you a difference of about 356 megawatts in terms of the dependable capacity and even more in terms of the installed capacity. Of course, we may not be using all of the installed capacity. But if we did know, even before I get to the cocoa conversation, if from the analysis I've just made, we were aware on the back of the trends that would get here, is it not only the fool who sees a problem coming and embraces it or does nothing? In this country, you see, we are very allergic to leadership being criticized. But until we get to that point where we, we are razor sharp with our criticism, and I agree, it must cut deep for change to come. And it's not just leadership, it is followership as well. We are also involved. We are all involved. That's why we have that song. In building our motherland, we are all involved. But if we fail to hold leadership accountable on the back of where we stand on the political spectrum, then we might as well keep mum or go wherever else we want to go. Don't talk about it. But some of us have to talk about it. Which is what brings me to the cocoa dissipation angle of my conversation this morning. Because I can't think far. You know, sometime last year and early this year, I was talking about Ecuador and the others and how they are revamping their cocoa industry. Ghana has been retrogressing over time. And now it's got to the point where if we are not careful, the cocoa we like to boast of, well, let's go to the slide. So we have experienced the cocoa bean shortage. Ghana risks losing access to the second tranche of the cocoa syndicated uh, loan. And the country is turning to traders to try to plug the funding uh, gap. But if you look at the total syndicated loan secured in 2023, we're looking at $800 million. Uh, Cocobot doesn't have enough beans now to support the second and final tranche of $200 million. Of course, if your production hasn't met what was expected, then that means what you are expecting. Because mind you, it comes to facilitate, and then you get the money in advance, do what must be done, and then they also make their returns and get their money back. But if you're not able to uh, reach the end of your, your agreement or the bargain, fulfill that end, what happens? The other end, it's, it's contract. That's how it is, contractual. Now, the 200 million we're looking at may not necessarily come. But there's a story in this trajectory, right? If you look at Ghana's struggling cocoa industry and the gap analysis, look, from the 2016-2017 season, all the way to 2023, 2024. From here, and the green, by the way, is Ghana. The green is the Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire. The red is Ghana. Look at the trends. 2016, 2017, Ivory Coast, the world leader, was producing 2 million uh, metric tons. It dipped in 2017, 2018 to 1.9 million. Marginal. But look at their trend. It is somewhere between 1.75 million. Averagely, average, they've held it constant from 2016 to 2024. 2 million, 1.9, 2.2, 2.1, 2.3, 2.1, 2.3, 1.8. And even this 1.8 is on, on the back of the general struggles that we are all facing, right? But look at Ghana. Dark reality. 969,000 metric tons, one of the best we've ever done, 2016, 2017. It fell to 904. 812, 771. Then we rose to that major high in 2020, 2021. One million. But I guess complacency may have set in because since then, we've reached the lowest in about a decade. Now at 580,000. You look at 969, you look at one million, and then you look at 580. We've nearly halved our, produ our production or output. 
Now, again, if you look at Ghana and Côte d'Ivoire in terms of their share in, in world production, Côte d'Ivoire in 2016-2017 had 43%. Again, you see how stable they are. 43, 42, 45, 45, 43, 44, 45. Look at Ghana. 20% of the market share when the Ivory Coast had 43%. We slumped to 19, 17, 16. Went, of course, that time when we produced 1 million metric tons. 20, 14, and now 13. You don't need to be a soothsayer. You don't need a crystal ball to tell you that we are in dire straits. When the market leader is producing 45% and you are producing 13% and the likes of Ecuador, even Brazil, the South American countries, even Asian countries are catching up and coming with force, we just might slip. And come to think of it, it's a major cash earner. Unfortunately, around this time, a ton of cocoa is worth more than, say, of copper. You're looking at more than $9,000. This would have been the best time to cash out especially when our economy is where it is. But misleadership has led us here. Now, you also look at the causes of drops in production because it's not in isolation, right? There are factors, and we see those factors. Galamse is one of them. So you look at smuggling because the systems are rife for that. You look at swollen shoot disease, and we've not dealt with it properly. We are rather dilly-dallying with the situation you look at galamse, then climate change, and then overaged food. All of these factors. And then you also look at the Ministry of Food and Agriculture and Bloomberg and a comparative analysis of cocoa farm gate prices versus international prices for this current season. The disparity paints a picture because the farm gate price per ton, which is what would likely give to the farmer, or maybe even less, 1,834. But the prevailing price per ton at the international level, on the international market, 9,638 currently. Are we giving enough incentive to the farmers? Are we? Look at what Côte d'Ivoire is doing to their farmers. I know something has been done from last year and all of that, but you must always, every step of the way, when you have a cash crop that is delivering for you the boons and basically the spine of your economy, right? The backbone of your economy, agriculture. Anywhere else, which is why you would see the trend of when, in fact, um, there are... Okay, so I'll just have to go back. On this, here we go, which is why you would see that smuggling is also in there. Crucial, because when you have prices that low and your competitors are willing to pay more, the farmers will be incentivized to smuggle. I'm not saying it's the right thing. I'm not saying it's the patriotic thing. But I'm saying that some people, especially finding ourselves where we do, will opt for that. But now... Let's again look at Ghana's struggling cocoa industry in terms of export value for the first two months. You look at 2020, $716.3 million, and then you follow the trend uh, from there. Now, 508.4, painting a critical uh, picture. But having spoken about energy, crucial to our national life, and spoken about cocoa, Crucial to our national life. I've, I've chosen three subjects. The last one I'll speak about is open defecation. We lose many tens of millions of dollars every year dealing with open defecation. The question, though, is where does that money really go? Because what I'm about to show you will leave you scratching your head. And the cost of saying when it comes to health, because once people do this, the likelihood of vegetarians and uh, diarrheas and uh, dysentery and everything in between is, is right at your doorstep, especially when the rains come. So, here we go. If you look at residential structures, total residential structures, 5.9 million, and, and that's the estimate. Houses without toilet facilities, 3.4 million. Can you imagine that? How do you even build without this? We've spoken time and again about houses having this, but how do you even build without that? 
than households without toilet facilities practicing open defecation, 1.47 million. If you look at the open defecation points in bushes or open fields or gutters, and by the way, even recently, in close proximity to the Independence Square, we caught someone defecating because there were weeds and everything there. Not the right thing to do, but it just tells you something, doesn't it? 1.38 million for this. At the beach, 61.4 thousand. Polythene bags, 17 thousand. Chamber pots, 18.6 thousand. That is 18,600. When you look at the total, you get that sum of 1.47 million. And some districts are more prone. I will not say they are more prone, vulnerable to it because of a lack of these systems. Let's walk through them. Nanumba North, 25,000 plus. Tema. Uh, metropolitan area, 23,000, you know, plus, 600 plus. Tema. So there's Tamale, but Tema is in there also. Tamale metropolitan area, 23,622. Gushegu municipal, 22,000 plus. Sagnarigu, 21,000. We're starting with um, the Northern Belt. Now it's interesting because there are a lot of um, those in the Northern Belt in here. Then Ketu South municipal, 20,000 um, plus. But then you start coming closer. And Ablekuma South, 368. Ashiedu Keteke, 168. Okaikwe South, 138. The total, AMA total, 647. But then, yes, I told you Tema was coming. When you look at constituencies, Tema East, 2,938. Tema Central, 1,499. The TMA total, that is the Tema Metropolitan Assembly, 4,437. For me, while, indeed, the Tamale figures are way higher, I feel in a place like Tema, how can this even be happening? Right in the center of town. Right in the hub of industry. And then you look at other constituencies. Unfortunately, my good friend Sticker's constituency is here in Shiaiso 456. Uh, and, and this has to do with the, the, the open defecation points. Bantama, um, Honorable Francis Asensubwache, 418, Manchia North, 357, Subin, 188, Manchia South, 107. That is for uh, the KMA. And then we'll also look at the Tamale Metropolis going back there. Uh, Tamale South, 21,000 plus. Tamale Central, 23,000 uh, plus. In the central uh, region as well, well, in other areas, Mfantiman Municipal, 5,000 plus. Jamoro, 3,000, K2 South, over 3,000. Other districts, Ada, West, East, Tema, Ningo, Pram, Pram. Uh, Sam George, 1,526 right there. How are you helping deal uh, with the situation? So basically, when you look at these three components that are brought to you today, it's a holiday. Pardon me if I, I've engaged in uh, taking more of the time, but I get exasperated. I get tired. Even as someone who has to look at these figures on a daily basis, I get tired. Why do we have to be here? Oh, and by the way, that also reminds me of the vice president's promise that uh, within two years of their tenure or something like that, there would be no you know, facility or no house without running water and toilet facilities and all that. What happened, Mr. Vice President? So as I wish the president, Nanado Danko Ekufuado, a happy birthday, I hope he will take time to reflect on the doomsaw he spoke about so passionately in 2015 and 2016. I hope that he will also look at the cocoa, which he lambasted the former administration for time without number and where we are today. I hope he will cast his eyes, his gaze, to open defecation and realize that we've come a long way, actually, without coming a long way. My name is Benjamin Akapu. These are my blunt thoughts shared with you, raw, hot, unedited, and diluted. As always, God bless Ghana and make a great and strong.
Welcome back on the AM show. We continue with a conversation this morning as we get into our big stories. We are interacting with the member of parliament for Bole Bamboy and some of those crucial issues I've already laid bare in my blunt uh, thoughts I'll be looking at. But I'll also be contemplating uh, taxation in relation to non-compliance by businesses in Ghana, corruption as far as the public accounts committee sittings are concerned, and uh, why the opposition NDC thinks the 24-hour economy is a game changer. But um, let me now bring in my guest. He is a legislator for Bolibam Boy. Yusuf Suleimana is his name. Good morning. Good morning, Ben. How are we doing? Um, under the circumstances. <laughs> we, we are managing. Yeah. But today is Mr. President's birthday. Do you have any, any words for the president? Yes. As, nice as, words. As, as nice words. It's his birthday. Ben, first of all, let me say good morning <laughs> to uh, our viewers, especially the people of Bole Bamboy, and for that matter, the Savannah region of this country. Yes, today is the birthday of our president, uh, who is left with some few moms to, to go. I can only wish him well and to suggest to him that a few moms left, he should do something so that he's able to go home with some legacy. Mm. As it stands now, if he was to end his regime today, uh, I don't think he'll be going home with any good uh, legacy. Uh, he inherited an economy that was far, far better than what we are seeing today. Mm. He inherited um, a situation where we had been able to resolve the issues of Dumso. Today we are in Dumso. And so if these things are not resolved before he leaves uh, office, um, I think that that will be what he will be, he'll be remembered, remembered of. And so I wish our president very well. Um, like I said, he should end up well. That's what I want to say. All right. He's 80 today. Yes. It's a grand old age. You know what the Bible says, 70 years assigned to every man. Not everyone gets there. Uh, and I use man in the generic sense, as the Bible does. And 80 years, if you are strong. No, it's a blessing. He has, he has reached 80. It's a blessing. But there's a saying that it's not the number of years you live on this earth that matters. Mm. It is the good deeds that you would have left behind if even you spent a very few number of uh, years. And that, for me, is very, very important. Mm. You can live for centuries and will not have any legacy that people will use to mention your name after you've gone. And so if you ask me, yes, I want to live longer, but I want to leave this world with some legacy that even when I'm not there, people are able to associate those good things uh, with my name. And I think that, that for me is very important. I mean, you... to, be, to be honest with you, I don't want to go very Islamic, but the Prophet Muhammad, I uh, spent only 63 years, okay? Mm. But his name is everywhere. And his religion keeps on, you know, expanding. That, for me, is worth, uh, it's worth it. It's, it's better than a situation where you would have lived for 200 years when you have nothing to show. But I, I wish the president very well. It's a blessing. I mean, to have 80 years on this earth is, is a, a, a blessing. Well... So let's get into the substantive issues that we're going to be discussing. But before we get into them, you, you watched my blunt thoughts. I was talking about Dumso. And now people are coming up with their own timetables on the back of what the energy minister said. And he says, why would people think such evil for the country uh, in terms of a, a timetable? I don't know about it being evil, especially when we just want guidance in respect of our power situation. Two days ago, my lights went off <clears throat> on five occasions. Sometimes I get home and I, I can tell the power must have gone off at some point because something, maybe my fridge, my fridge is the easiest one to go to and then I can tell that something happened in my absence. In some places, they say in the course of the day, it goes off by evening, it's on. In other places, I mean, it's a mishmash uh, issues. What is your doomsaw situation where you are? Do you have a timetable yet? I'm struggling to draw my own timetable because uh, it keeps on going off and on, off and on. It started, and I thought it was going to be Mondays and Thursdays, and so I took notice of that. Now, 
uh, I can't tell. Last night, for instance, it went off about three times. It rained heavily around my area. That's coming 20. Right. And so in the evening, it wasn't there. And then it came back around six something. By eight, nine, when the rain started, it went off. And then after some two hours, it came back. So in fact, uh, if we have a schedule, that will help us. And so I was surprised when I heard the energy minister more or less insulting the intelligence of Ghanaians. For me, you owe us that responsibility. You're a minister of state. Is it a taxpayer's man that is used to pay you? The comfort and whatever you enjoy is as a result of the taxpayer's uh, efforts. And so if you cannot do anything at all to resolve the matter, and Ghanaians are not even saying resolve it immediately, they are humbly asking you to give them a shelter so that they can plan. So that if I know that from morning to evening I'm off, I know what to do. In fact, this morning, it was difficult to even get light to iron my, my, my shirt. And so these are some of the things. But I am not surprised. I like Napo. But even on the floor of parliament sometimes, his attitude is that of, uh, he has this kind of arrogant posture. I don't know whether it's part of his life. It's better he, 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 he I mean, he has to do something about it. This is a man who why, wants why, why do you call him arrogant? Oh, if not, because I also know that in this country, if you are outspoken and you, you have your convictions and you speak in a certain manner, sometimes confidence and a stance. There's a difference between confidence. There's a arrogance. difference between confidence and arrogance. Mm. Ghanaians have humbly asked you, as their minister responsible for energy, that yes, we know that we are in difficulties. Yes, we know that we are in doom. So, all we ask of you is to give us a schedule so we can plan our lives. And then you respond to them in this manner. If that is not arrogance, I don't know what else I would describe as arrogance. Okay, that's not confidence. If somebody is confident and somebody is speaking his mind on issues you know, but when somebody wants to insult people, you also know. And that, that's unfortunate. I am aware that he's one of those who is uh, hoping to be a running mate with this attitude. Are you, saying, are, you, are you saying he doesn't make the cut for you? I mean, with this kind of words and, 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 and posture uh, as a minister of state, but if you become a vice president, I'm sure you whip us. You ask the military and the police to whip us any time we speak our minds. This is a colleague member of parliament you're speaking. He's a friend. He's been education minister, he's now energy minister, and you speak of him in this manner? Well, I'm not insulting him. I'm simply saying that if he doesn't change this attitude, somebody's told me that he, his ministry uh, apologized or something. I haven't seen that uh, apology uh, correspondence. But if that is true, then it contradicts his position, okay? So for me, going forward, Napo should respect Ghanaians, and Napo should be um, mindful of the fact that it is the taxpayer's man that we used to pay him. And this posture will not take him anywhere. And that's my advice to him. I'm not insulting him. Let's quickly take a look at the two other issues I raised. And, and I see you have, have some of the data when it comes to open defecation. But there's also the crucial issue of our cocoa and where, where we find ourselves. Uh, we've plummeted, I think, apart from the 2020-2021 season, when we had a, a high of 1 million metric tons, going back to 2016, 2017, when we had almost 1 million, 900, uh, and I think 80 something thousand plus. We've been falling, and now we're almost half that figure. At a time when a ton of cocoa is more expensive than copper, where we could have, if we were producing on a higher level, like Cote d'Ivoire is doing, we could have reaped the boons, but we are not. Right. So I want your quick reflections on these two, and then we'll get into it. Yes, so we all know that in 2015-2016, we're getting to 1 million metric ton. Mm. Now, go and look at the records. At that time, we had also embarked on expansion of our uh, cocoa farms. And that is what resulted into the increment in the subsequent uh, years. Unfortunately, there were other factors that were also reducing the population of cocoa in this country that we didn't pay attention to. 
or we thought that you know other matters are more important than cocoa. For instance, take Galamse. We were in this country when farmers were crying and saying that their lands were being taken by uh, gold miners, yet we didn't do anything about it. So what do you expect? Ben, the result is that people now decided to even sell their cocoa farms and those trees were felt and all of that. Again, it's as a result of mismanagement. I remember very well that the, uh, the Director General, the, the, the CEO of uh, Ghana Cocoa, uh, Cocoa Board, Cocoa Board came to meet the Public Accounts Committee. And you realize that the kind of debt that they are accumulated, they are unable to even pay the debt. Yes, still, the kind of expensive life they are living, and again, the number of people they have recruited. Nobody is saying don't recruit. But you don't recruit that because you want to get jobs for people. When they go sit there and they didn't do anything, these are some of the problems. And so for me, I'm not surprised that we are here. Uh, all we want is that there should be a change of government, and that change of government should be able to avert some of these situations. One of the things that we are proud of is this cocoa uh, industry. Say so a change of government. Sure. But I just but, told you. But, but hold on, hold on. When I, you know, when I deal with politicians, I always want to hold you to uh, our ways, and that's fair. When, when the NDC, the previous administration, was in power, there was op open defecation. There was galamsey affecting uh, cocoa, and we had doomso. So, no, first of all, let me start with yes. the issue of doomso. We had Dumso, but Dumso was resolved. Yes, but we had Dumso. Yes, but it was Three resolved. Years, and Dumso had... didn't start with the NDC administration. I, I that never was... said that. Yes. I never said that. So, yes, there was Dumso. started all the way from Rolling. Yes, but there was Dumso, and Mama accepted that there was Dumso. It's not today that people don't want to even accept that we have Dumso. When we, have, we are in Dumso, that is honesty. That is transparency. He came out and said, yes, there was Dumso, but I was going to fix it. And he did fix it. That is the difference. To the issue of Goku, I just told you, that yes, even though we're having problems with Galamse and all of that, yet we're able to move to almost one million. And then I also told you that we had planted so much that resulted into the expansion or the increase in cocoa farms and all of that in subsequent years, which they inherited. Now, when it was their time to also ensure that yes, they reduce the Galamse impact on cocoa farms, yes, they also ensure that they expand the farms, they fail in doing that. And that is why today we are going back. And I'm saying that, yes, when we come back, we've done it already, we will be able to do it better. That's just what I'm saying. Now, the issue of open... Let, 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 me, let me just take you back to Doomso briefly. Yes. Um, your own member of parliament on your side, yes. Edward Bauer, yes. together with other analysts, have yes. said that, look, it's going to get really bad with the power situation, especially from 2025. No matter who takes over, that person is going to inherit quite an albatross round their necks, um, right? Um, how, how, do you, how does your party hope to deal with the Dumso situation, assuming a, you get into power? Inshallah, we'll get into power. But you see... You don't have the, any money. You are, are no, an IMF no, program. Yes, but let me, tell you, let me tell you, this is the NDC for you. And Bawa, Edward Bawa, who is a very good friend, would have told you that we are working seriously on our manifesto, and there's a think tank, a group, of experts who have been put together. And at one of their meetings, I was privileged to be there. And they had identified that, yes, 2025 onwards, we're going to have a serious uh, problem when it comes to power. And so what are they doing? This think tank, I can tell you, have put together a proposal that is going to resolve this issue when we come to power. Now, what I will not do here is to expose to you the proposal that they have put together. I'm privileged that to, have, to have that information, but it's not for me to sit here and say that this is what we intend to do to solve it. Okay? If they cannot fix it, they should back out and give us the way, and we'll fix it. And that was what we were told. We were told that if the kitchen was hot, we should back out. In 2016, yes, we left the kitchen. They came in. Now it's hotter than it was. And so for me, whether it's about electricity or power problems, what is about Galamse problems, we are saying that we are better off, we are in a better position to fix it. And that's what I'll tell you, Eben. All right. Um, 
Were you going to make a final point on open defecation? Yes, yeah, so... so I want been, to reserve the rest of the time. It's been, it's, been, it's been an issue over the years. And if you go to my constituency, I've seen NGOs supporting Chrome communities with uh, very simple, uh, if you like, KVIPs and other facilities to ensure that they don't do open defecation, even the rural communities. And like you said, sometimes we can also play a role. In my case, for instance, there's a community called Mandare. An NGO wanted to give them water. And the condition was that if you do not have uh, a KVIP or a toilet facility within your vicinity, you are not going to benefit. So the individual were, household were struggling to do this, how to go in to assist them by giving them about four to 500 bags of uh, cement shared to each uh, household, which helped them and they were able to put up these uh, facilities. And that enabled them to benefit from this water project. And I think that uh, government should pay attention to this, and all of us should pay attention to this, because it's a very serious matter. But just to conclude on this, even in Accra, as we speak, Accra is not the neatest uh, town in this country. But we promised by the president that he was going to make Accra the cleanest uh, city. What has happened to that? Again, apart from uh, uh, open defecation, the general well-being, the general cleanliness of our environment is very important. The NDC had introduced a monthly cleanup exercise, okay, by community people voluntarily. They were not going, this wasn't going to be to bring any cost to government. What happened to it <clears throat> when the MPP took over? They decided that they were going to stop it. They stopped it, and as we speak. Go around and see what is happening in our communities. Why are we doing this? We, to we have our filth exhibition. It's, it's, it's something we, a series we've yes. started. And this actually feeds into it. It, it. it paints quite a picture when it comes to filth. But even as we talk about what leadership should do, sometimes I also look at us. How do we manage our environment? You see people dropping things everywhere. And once you do that, once you litter like that, there will be consequences. It comes back to bite us, especially when the rains come. Man, you know, you see, everything boils down to leaders. I, I agree that there should be some level of cooperation, some level of, you know, uh, responsibility from the citizenry. But I'll go to Rwanda and see. I've been there before. The facilities are there. If you want to drop something, you move at every reasonable distance. There's a dustbin there, you can drop it. So if I want to drop something, I don't have any place to drop it. I put it in my pocket. How many of them can I keep in my pocket? At the end of the day, I'm tempted to drop it somewhere. So yes, there should be some kind of collaborative effort where the facilities are there. And when the person now refuses to do what is right, then you can hold the person responsible. I remember very well the late uh, uh, Vice President, Ali Umar, Ali Umar. who had started uh, an initiative where we're saying that uh, uh, even urinating uh, indiscriminately was going to be, uh, 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 wasn't going to be accepted. He started it very well, and he was catching up with Ghanaians. What happened to it? So yes, I agree that we have a responsibility, but it all boils down to leadership. Put in place all the structures and see whether people will not uh, obey. Like I said to you, voluntarily, Ghanaians were ready every month to go out there to clean their environment. Right. What made us to stop it? So I guess today we are some, some precedents have been set that are haunting us uh, now. But let's get into other matters. There are three crucial areas I want to address with you. And I'd like to start with, since you, you, you are very interested, you're an interested party, you sit on some of these corruption-related matters emanating from the Public Interest and Accountability uh, Committee of Parliament. What's the latest you can share with us and how are things going? Because we've heard this use of even free SHS feeding and the different groupings involved, skewed in this area or that. But I'd like to find out from you, what are you unearthing? In that? Friend, you know, the Public Accounts Committee reports are structured in a way that uh, makes it very interesting. For instance, we look at procurement uh, uh, irregularities. We look at tax irregularities. We look at contract irregularities. We look at debt, outstanding irregularities, and many more. Now, when it comes to corruption, what I've observed is that 
in all the sectors, you have some semblance of corruption going on. Take school feeding, for instance. You go to the school, the report shows that they have received this quantity of food items. Then you uh, ask them physically, and they tell you that they haven't received that. But the money has been deducted as source. So it means that... And this supplier has been paid. This supplier has been paid. For you, goods not delivered, for goods not, not fully delivered. Not fully delivered, in most cases. And the head teachers are coerced to a point that they even find it difficult to talk. I remember in Tamari, for instance, one head teacher said uh, he doesn't want to talk and, 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 and something will happen to him. So he was trying to cover up. We had to push and push and push, and then the accountant now contradicted him. And it was so clear that, yes, even some of the foods, for instance, if you are in, let's say, a, a community called Savilugu, and they are supposed to bring food to you, supply you with, let's say, 100 bags of rice, they leave it in Tamale. Now, between Tamale and Savilugu, for instance, the cost of transportation has to be borne by the school. And so it ends up adding up to the cost of the food that you are going to buy. You don't have money in these schools, and they are struggling to do all this. But that's not even where I want to talk, 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 talk about. Then I realized something. Sitting in the Public Accounts Committee, I realized that sole sourcing has become the order of the day. The same sole sourcing, this The same sole sourcing, this administration, vehemently, vehemently opposed about. and lampooned us and blasted everybody under the Mama administration. And I just give you this time. But, but wait, just, just a quick one before you go there. Sole sourcing is not in itself a bad thing. I agree. I agree. It's only in a certain context. I agree. That it comes I agree. I agree. And so when the NDC was doing it, it should have been put in the right context. But we were told that sole sourcing is a conduit for corruption. And in 2018, Dr. Baumia said that we promised that we were going to move away from sole sourcing and we have delivered. That was why he said, if you can Google City uh, TV, you see it. Today, let me give you this status. I decided to go onto the uh, PPA uh, website mm. with my, my, my research assistants. And what we have seen is that in dollar terms, first of all, let me look at the total figure that I've arrived at. Between 2017 to 2023, 1,217 single source contracts were examined. And the total amount involved is 9 trillion, 620 million, 574,487.5. wrong there because you started with trillion and that's a huge figure. Do you mean billion? Yes, yeah, so, yeah, so that's billion, right? I'm sorry, that's billion. So it's 9 billion, 620 million, uh, 570, no, it's trillion, rather. Get me right. It's 9 trillion, okay? 620 million. No, then it, the next must be billion. Yes, yeah, sorry, million. 620 million, 570,000, uh, 447 Ghana City, 57 pesos. I see. This is the total figure that I came out with. I think it's not even written very well here. And this is in CD context, put all together. Hmm. So single source contracts between 2017 to 2023 from PPA uh, website, 1,217 contracts. And I went further to look at where these were coming from. Mm. And so Ghana Cocoa Board awarded a total of 141 uh, single source contracts. And that alone will give you over 6 billion. Now, in terms of the dollar and then the euro and pound sterling and all of that, I have the analysis there. What are we talking about? Apart from these single source projects that have been used to siphon money in their own ways, because they are saying that once you resort to single source contracts, it's a conduit for you to steal money. If you want to use their own ways, this is how far they have brought us. In their own ways, they are saying that... 1,217 1, single source uh, contracts within this uh, period. Under the NDC, it was less than 1,000. But the president was even in the 
uh, in Parliament, talk about it and to say that they are coming to save us from this corruption. Because in his own way, he said that using single source leads to corruption. What's the period again? When to 2017 to 2023. Okay, all right. You just go onto the uh, PPA website, you see it. There's another trend, and I can mention two, three institutions. In 2022, Public Accounts Committee, the Public, Corporation, Public and Corporation Board Audit Report, you have an institution like the National, no, the U, National Youth Authority, who had awarded contracts to the tune of about 35 million plus Ghana City, Varying that contract within three, four months to 73 million without recourse to the PPA Act. Another bridge there, about 38 million Ghana City was added up. This is a bridge, and this is a serious matter. I mean, nobody can prove to me that there's no corruption in this matter because already you have breached the law. Now, you also go to um, national lotteries, they are going to do single source and saying that they wanted the items under a certificate of uh, emergency. And so these items, there were small, small machines that were, you see these machines that they use at their right. vendor uh, points. points. They gave it to them. They ordered these uh, equipment. As I speak to you, since 2022, they are some of them are still stocked in their warehouse. So where's the emergency here? Clearly, there's something wrong there. And many, 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 many of these things are what is happening in this, in this, in this uh, administration. And so when it comes to corruption, I'm not surprised that the president is now running away from talking about corruption. The vice president is running away from corruption. Listen to them very well. For the past two, three years, they are low when it comes to the issues of corruption. But in 2016, that was their highest point. And we know that from the SONA, it's one of the things... Uh, the yes, so, so for instance, in the SONA, it was silent. Right. Why will you be silent on a very important matter? So like just this? to wrap on corruption, because in the next five minutes, I want us to look at two other questions. Yes. Basically, you're saying that we've not made any inroads. We have Shraj, we have the OSP, we have uh, all these other institutions. We've not made any progress in, in terms of the fight against... So Ben, in 2018, for instance, 2018, 2019, the president said that once the Special Prosecutor's Office was established, he was so certain that we're going to deal with corruption and deal with it very well. You have a stage, a situation where when the special prosecution's office starts to work, you have state institutions interfering. Take the case of Cecilia Dapa. Even before OS, OS could start, OSP could start its work, the president had declared her. Because if you say that I have so much trust in her and blah, 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 you are prejudicing the outcome of the investigation. So point made on that. Let's talk and, about... Let's quickly, for the sake of time, let's talk about taxation. Um, there's a lot of non-compliance, we know. In recent times, we heard the vice president talk about granting a clean slate to those who are not on board so that they can come on board. And some have wondered how that will be executed as well, especially considering that that could also send the wrong signals to, to those who are paying. Right. Um, and then you hear the vice president also say that the, v, the GRA is hounding or chasing people and making life unbearable for them, businesses. The tax situation, where did we go wrong and how do we remedy it? Yeah, Ben, before I talk about where we went wrong and the way forward, I was wondering who was speaking. I was wondering, listening to uh, my good brother, Dr. Bahumia, whether indeed uh, he was the one talking about taxes and talking about uh, talking the way he was talking. Now we all know that he got his job as a vice president because of his perceived expertise, okay, in the management of our economy. The president was so clear by saying that, look, I need somebody with economic background to partner me. And indeed, it was this reason that they used to convince many, many, many MPP uh, stalwarts to accept him because they saw him as somebody who was not even part of them. So these were the points that were used. That look, he's an expertise in the, uh, the management of our economy, he's all of that. And so they were able to push him through, even though he was not a party member. He came and he started his work very well. 
and he was the one heading, or he's still the one heading, the economic management team. The economic management team can look at both physical and monetary issues. They have the right to do that because they need to work in collaboration with both monetary and physical policy units. And he is the one sharing this uh, uh, team. So the question to ask is, did he have these ideas long before, or is none that he's thinking of these ideas? If indeed he had these ideas long before, did he suggest this to the president or not? But the president has told you, the vice president has said he's like a driver's mate. I'll and come the to president that. in the sonar. So, so, so if you're a driver... The buck stopped with him. If you're a driver mate, you have a responsibility. Your work is cut out as to what to do and what not to do. And I'm saying that his work was cut out for him and that he was supposed to manage the economy. He was supposed to be the head of the economic management team. Is he saying that he has failed in doing that? If he has not failed, then it means that, one, he had these ideas but decided not to tell the president so that he can keep them to himself. Today he wants to run for presidency and now he comes to use them. Or he suggested to the president and the president refused. So what's the In way? both cases. How, how do we get out of this? How do we? Yes, I'll come to that. We've spoken about the fact that we've not stratified our tax regime properly. A few people are overburdened with taxes and there's a chunk of people who are not paying taxes, though we all pay indirect taxes. When you purchase the credits and all that, you pay taxes. What's the way forward? Yes, but you're, you're moving me away from looking at the person talking and whether or not what he's saying is... One more right. minute on that. Yes, so one, 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 one more minute on that. Look, in 2017, uh, and you can still Google, even if you go to the trade, uh, uh, Ministry of Trade's website, they have 13 comprehensive points that they had listed to be able to transform or industrialize this uh, country. And the number two was that they were going to reduce interest rate and also reduce the burden uh, of taxes on enterprises. That was the, the second uh, point that they raised. Fast forward, what has happened to that? And you're now coming to tell us that you have new ideas. Why didn't you suggest these ideas to your president? And if you have done that, one evidence that yes, I have done that, if not, I would describe my brother as a wicked person. Because if well, you are, that, yes. That, that is a strong. No, it's you not. Are, hold on, hold on. You are describing the vice president as wicked. On condition that if indeed he had these all ideas that he could supply to his boss and he refused and was taking salary and sitting there, then he could be described as a wicked person. But if he did, uh, what is it called, suggested these things to the president, the president refused, that's a different matter. And we want evidence from him to show that, yes, I have advised him, he refused. Because he was employed as a vice president. But to he has already said that it's not anything that he comes up with that is accepted. He exactly. said that already. My point is that if you have said that and they refuse, let's know. Because again, we pay you. Ghanaians pay you. And they expect you to deliver. So why are you telling those that you have been able to achieve and not telling those that you have had difficulties in, uh, in pushing them Okay, through? so in, enough on the vice president. What's the way forward? How do we... So let me tell you. Another minute. This, 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 uh, give me some two, three minutes. This idea of uh, flat rates hasn't started today. But the way the, president, the vice president is proposing it is unsustainable. Now let me just ask a question. In the 2024 budget... Tax revenue is estimated to be 11 billion. Okay? And he was part of the drafting of this uh, budget. He didn't see anything wrong with that. Now you are saying that in 2025, when you come, you will ensure that there's no tax payment. Now it means that. I, I 11, don't think that's what he's. Suggesting. No, he said that it's going to be general amnesty. Yes, but an amnesty means we're wiping no, the slate clean, but you are going to start. No, he payments. said you're not going to pay at all for a certain period. He said yes, it. but he's saying that we are starting afresh. That's yes, what, so they are going to start. But he paying. said that he said that he's going to have a clean sheet, and he's going to ensure that there's tax amnesty. Tax amnesty means that you won't pay taxes. I get it, and but I'm I say that, moving forward after that, the same people are going to have to pay now. No, okay. but what I, I'll come to that. But what I'm saying is that you see, you have to look at the statement he's made, whether it's sustainable or not, mm. whether that statement is honest or not, whether that statement he meant it or not. In other words, the because, 11 billion that has been projected, if those people don't pay, is that what you are suggesting? No. So what I'm saying is that if today you are saying that we need 11 billion, and that 11 billion will be used to solve some of our social problems, okay? 
And you are saying that when you become a president, God forbid, in 2025, you're going to give tax amnesty. People, amnesty, people will not pay taxes. Now, if people don't pay taxes, how are you going to mobilize revenue to be able to meet the basic things? We have educational issues, we have health issues, and all of that. Don't also forget that some of these taxes that we pay go into some statutory uh, funds. What happens to those funds? Debt fund is there. National health insurance is there. What are you doing about them? That's the other uh, angle, angle you have to look at it. Final but you see, point, and it is not about, it's not about flat rate. It's not about progressive tax regime or regressive tax uh, regime. The problem, if you ask me, is it all boils down to the issue of compliance. People, even the, the, the few that are paying are not paying. Yes, you can expand it. But if you don't address the issue of non-compliance, you still have problems. Why are we having problems with non-compliance? One is because of the perception of the unfairness of our tax system. Look, Adam Smith in his uh, book stated... You, you had to go to Adam Smith. Yeah, stated to... four principles that we have to always look at. The principle of equity or equality, mm. the principle of convenience, the principle of e economy, and e again, you have to also look at the issue of whether or not they even have what it takes to be able to pay it. Now, so if you are able to look at all these things and relate them to whatever decision you take, you'll be able to get a behavior change that will result into uh, payments of right taxes. Now. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time, unless you want to yes. land on that. Yeah, so, so what I'm saying is that, let me, let me tell you what I think should be done. Right. So the issue of tax uh, perception right. will have to be addressed. Mm. Now, there's a relationship, and literature has established that, there's a relationship between tax perception and tax compliance behavior. It's a relationship. In between this relationship is the issue of, uh, if you like, tax legitimacy. Now, if there are problems with institutional trust, which we are facing today, the vice president mentioned the issue of the GRA going to sit at people's places and all of that. And so uh, this whole uh, issues of non-compliance boils down to uh, the fact that we've not been able to address this issue. Ben, I thought that I would have had enough time to look at this, but uh, we can make this another time. But I think already we've, we've looked at major angles in respect of this. And at least that point you make about the, the, the projection of 11 billion versus how the vice president is going to be able to rake in the required revenue to power the economy yeah. in respect of what he's saying uh, leaves a lot or gives us a lot of fodder for our minds. But, Yusuf, thank you for joining us oh, we are done? Uh, this morning. <laughs> Ben, I think that you should have, you should have time today, for me to look today at Today has a, a packed show. For and, me to uh, look, at, look at this issue of uh, taxation and, and what the... Uh, 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 let's let's, let's see only. what issues percolate on the back of this and let's have further conversations, maybe together with other tax-oriented people. Yes, I'll, on, I'll, I'll love on that. These. I'll, I'll love that. But that's another opportunity we'll see. Ben, let me everything. thank my... my, my brother and uh, the family, the former president and uh, the wife, they are Christians. And I know today is good uh, Friday. Friday. Even though they are not Catholics, I don't expect them to dress like the way you are dressed. <laughs> but it's a period that, today is a very special day. Muslims are fasting. Today is a Friday, okay? And today is also a good Friday for Christians. I ask that we are able to work together as a people. There should be peace in this country. And on that note, I want to also uh, thank the people of Bole Bamboy for this honor. I mean, I've always said that, Ben, I'm from a poor home, but they have honored me by making me a member of parliament, representing them. And so I've always said to myself that uh, I owe them and I want to see peace in that area. And I tell you, 2025 is their year. 2025, when Mama becomes the president, inshallah, Bole, and for that matter, Savannah region, and by extension, the North will take its right position so that we are okay. able to close the gap, okay? While he's developing the Southern sector, he also look at how to bring the Northern sector on board so that we have a country where you have our young children refusing education and running to Accra and, and, and people will end up building hostels for them, like my brother, Dr. Bohemia, uh, is doing. Your brothers and your sisters are running here in, in search of a greener pasture and all you do is to accommodate them by building hostels for them. 
I see Where every, every, every opportunity you get, you Thank will you. want to take on uh, the vice president. Of no, course, the former I, president I'm himself, a, very... a member of parliament for that area, uh, Bole Bamboy. Thank you, Yusuf, for joining us for well, breakfast I'm grateful. Uh, this morning. No. Yusuf Suleimana is member of parliament for Bole Bamboy. He joined the conversation here. But do stick and stay. We have a lot more coming your way as we host the 2022 National Best Teacher um, who is on a mission to award outstanding teachers, especially in rural communities. We'll be right back. as well as the uh, lynch in Ghana. Thank you so much for this. I'm humbled. Thank you. Some of you have thought for over uh, two decades, but you've not received any appreciation. This award is a surprise to me, and it's going to encourage and motivate me to work more, to glorify God, Adam West, and my school as well. Thank you. Nobody lights a candle and puts it under a table. Nobody will see the light. Exactly. First of all, I'm very grateful to God to this award. I wasn't expecting it, but what God has done for me is to do more. This award is going to prepare me to do more for the kids and maybe beyond the classroom. Because, as the Bible says, hard work is. So, my work has been recognized and this helped me to do more and more in the teaching profession. And so, except you put yourself out there, nobody knows what you are doing in singing. This feels so good. It feels so great. Um, I'm grateful to Teacher Applaud Initiative for this honor than me. Um, what he's expected, the feeling is awesome. I'm so grateful. It's, it's going to help me do more because it shows that I'm being recognized. Thank you, teacher. Thank you, Chimala. God bless you. I'm great. Through her initiative, she's done a lot of things that I see from afar. She put it out there until I've seen it from afar. I don't know whether you are seeing it as well. She's written so many hours and hours and hours and hours. I see her giving shoes to learn it. So, a plot teacher award made a stop here at Adam West. And I should say that today has been different, the feeling has been different. Because, um, as always, what we seek to achieve is to widen the smile on the face of people. I want to say a very big thank you to Senor. Senor, thank you for coming through for us, sponsoring the citation, and to Cindy. I want to say I'm grateful. And to all the other sponsors who are yet to come, we pray that you keep supporting the teacher to do more in the class and beyond the class. Stay blessed and thank you.
Welcome back on the AM show. We continue with our conversation. So right now, though, casting light or shedding light on the situation of the teacher in uh, Ghana. Well, joining this conversation, she's actually the 2022 National Best Teacher. And she's out there on a mission to award outstanding teachers, especially those in rural communities who are often overlooked. Some of them, if you see the struggles they have to go through, just to ensure that their charges, those who have been given to them, are taught. It would amaze you. I'm sure you've seen those um, documentaries in the past, Schools Under Trees, and the one who used to write in the air or on the ground so that uh, the children can have an inkling of what she was talking about. Well, Stella Jimalabi is uh, in the studio with us. She's having breakfast with us uh, to talk about Applaud Teacher Awards. Applaud Teacher Awards. Stella, good morning. Good morning, gentlemen. <laughs> good to be seated by you again. Why, why do you sound slightly mischievous this morning? I was <laughs> wondering about your black, but... But, but I've... Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Good Friday. Good Friday. Christ is dying for us. And uh, as a staunch Catholic, I, 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 this, is, this is the most important day. Hmm on the liturgical calendar for us. So there's a lot we do and there's a lot. I mean, ordinarily, if I had my way, I wouldn't be working today because oh. it's, it's a very meditative, reflective day for me. But we come and do this for God and country. Yeah. Right? But the other bit too, I am mourning, especially as I shared with my blunt thoughts. I am mourning Ghana. Yes, because the misleadership and where we found ourselves. Well, when, when was the last time your light went off? Do you have a doomsday timetable? There is no timetable. It, it happens as and when. We are making hours now. We are not waiting because... <laughs> you, you've then come you, up with your timetable? Yeah, so you can help yourself. Yeah. Mm. I heard somebody say that we should make our own timetable. So we'll make our own well, timetable. People, people have made their own timetables. In my area, it's a bit erratic. So okay. even getting that is a bit um, difficult. In that. But let's talk about the Ghanaian teacher. The Ghanaian teacher. Um... You won this coveted award in 2022. But if I asked you about the status quo when it comes to the teacher in Ghana today, what would you say? Um, I, I will always say it bluntly that the teacher is marginalized. The teacher is not given um, what they really deserve. A lot of sacrifices are being given out by the teacher, but... They don't get the proceeds, physical proceeds, out of what they are working for. So aside um, giving out your everything to see the dream Ghanaian child excel um, in the next couple of years, the, t the state of the teacher itself is not something that you'll be so excited about. Mm. It's not something that people are really happy about. It's not something that I am happy about. Um, I've, I won the national best teacher, but you look at others and they question national best teacher. What about the other teachers? What are the opportunities out there for them? How can they also get to where you've gotten to? We've gotten here, but there are still a lot to be done. Mm, there's still a lot to be yeah. done, uh, which brings to mind this bit right before we talk about uh, applaud teacher awards. Uh, You've heard about the laptop situation. Mm. Now we're giving tablets to students and uh, the numbers don't add up. Because if you look at the number of students and what was sent to Parliament and the numbers we are giving out and why we even waited for an electoral year to do this for a promise that has been given, had been given over seven years ago. That's another matter. But you have over 100,000 teachers who even paid for the laptops. Some say fully. Yeah. Because it wasn't just the 30%. There were SNIT contributions yes, from what I heard. about three, um, three right. parts. Right. It was deducted from source. From source. Yeah. So these teachers say, They have paid for these laptops. They don't have them. What does this say about how we prioritize, or otherwise, teachers in Ghana? So as I said earlier, we have been marginalized. And so where we really have to be given the places that we deserve. Others are given more priority than us. I feel a lot can be done for the teacher. I feel the teacher, that's why I'm so much interested when it comes to teacher development. 
and youngsters' development. I believe that if a teacher is satisfied, the teacher can give more than he or she is given. It is the teacher who thinks, you know, it is only teachers who have sleepless nights over other people's children. And so if the one having sleepless nights over other people's children is not well catered for, then there will be gaps. Then where the teacher has to give 100%, you see the teacher giving 30% or 40%. And so instead of them um, spending all the time that they have to do, because I always say that teaching goes beyond, it transcends beyond the four walls of the classroom. Mm. You go home, you're think, thinking about the learners. You go home, you're preparing your teaching notes. You go home, you're preparing your teaching aids. You go you're home, probably you're, marking scripts. Exactly. You're researching, looking for new strategies that you can put together to help the learners. And so if what I need to give to these learners are not given, then there are gaps. Hmm. Which is why I believe you've started this Applaud Teacher Awards. Yeah. But I'll ask you this, not because I do not know, but because I want you to expand the subject. Why should we applaud the Ghanaian teacher? Who taught you? Many teachers. Many teachers. Well, Start, the... Starting from the very best I had right from the start, my parents. I got home tuition for uh, quite a bit. My brothers down to me who were homeschooled for a bit. So by the time we started school, we were miles ahead. Oh, wow. So your so, parents so my were the parents teachers. were our very first teachers, especially my father. He, was, he gave us a certain grounding that... I look forward to giving my own children when I do have them. And I have passed on in many areas because I'm a teacher myself. Okay. And I've taught in different places. So oh, they're the runaway teacher, you see. <laughs> <laughs> Once so, a teacher, always a teacher. Always a teacher. So tell me, when, um, when was the last time you visited your school to applaud your teacher? I think the last time I saw one of my teachers, not... No, visited, visited your school um, or looked for the teachers. There, there are so many of them, but... The last time would be the University of Ghana at some point this year. What about the basic school and then the senior high school? Well, it's also because some of them are not even in close proximity to talk about. Mm. But what about, I'm sure there was one person who really touched you. There have been a few mm -hmm. and some of them I reach out to. Okay, good. And so based on the, the impact and the influences that teachers give out, I've realized that it's so important that you recognize their efforts. Because I believe a little smile, words, go the long way to affect the teacher. Um, throughout my period, before I became the national best teacher, in 2019, when I got the chance to start this process, wherever you get to, they ask you, um, have you been recognized by any institution? And I realized that I had nothing. Meanwhile, we have... Um, Ghana DJs Awards, we have the Ghana Music Awards, we have the, all the awards you can think about. But aside the National Award for Teachers, are there other awards, are there other institutions that actually go out there to surprise the teachers? And so um, together with my team, we came out with this initiative. After I had gone through the process and realized that the teacher needs to be surprised, in a positive way. In a positive because way. Because some of our teachers are surprised <laughs> in a very negative way. In, in I've a had positive teachers, way. In you know, a positive share with way. us how they were assigned to a certain place, yeah. a certain community. Yeah. Now, you're expecting a school, right? And, and you, you go, go and, ah, why am I looking into air? Well, that's the school. Yeah. There's no structure. Yeah. There's nothing. Yeah. Yes. And nothing. that's the school. No, no, I, I know of some there. of these teachers who have now had to put up ramshackle structures, whatever. Mm. I mean, some of the teachers, especially those, you know, posted to certain communities, you have to feel for them. And some actually put in the effort. Uh, for some of them, it has changed their lives. Mm. Moving to some, I don't want to mention any parts, so it doesn't appear I am stereotyping. But some parts of the country are in dire, dire need. Yeah. When it comes to infrastructure and so many other things on all levels, all levels. It is, it is out of these that um, we felt that, can we go and fish out these teachers? And how do we do that? Through their students, their past students, through their colleagues, through their head teachers. 
And so we don't need to come and vet your lesson notes. We don't need to come and sit in the class to see how you are teaching. Testimonies from testimonials from people pushes us, edges us to go there. So, so where have you been so far? I mean, ah. looking for such teachers doing great things, mm -hmm. but not getting acknowledged. No exactly. one sees. Nobody sees. Um, very soon, I'm sure I'm going to share with you the works of some of these teachers that we, they are doing that we've gone to surprise. So there's a teacher in the Ashanti region. If I mention the name, it wouldn't be a surprise again. Because the Applaud Teacher Award comes as a surprise. We, we just arrange, we come to your school, or there is a mini day bar organized by the directors, and then we come to surprise you. And the person doesn't even know the person that doesn't this know. Deba and everything hey, is actually about exactly. me. Exactly. Oh, wow. That, that, is, that, that would be such a surprise. Exactly. So th that, that has been the motive. I remember one of the schools it, during um, the COVID, around the latter part of 2020, we visited the school. The teacher actually organized the learners. They called for assembly. And they had no smack. She was conducting everything. And then we read the citation and we said, and the teacher to be applauded is? <laughs> and we mentioned the name. She was like, really? You didn't tell us. You didn't tell me. And so we felt that let's, let's put up this initiative. The teacher shouldn't know that um, out of what I'm doing, I have to put in this application. The process is quite cumbersome. And some people don't like to go through it. And so when we started this initiative, I can say that one of the teachers, in fact, two of them have received national award. Oh, wow. The recent, last year, we had one of them, Idi Amin, if he's watching. He, he, what was the name? Idi Amin. <laughs> really? You, yeah, you, you, should, you should host him one of these days. You should host him. Idi Amin, he was the second runner up. Wow. And we surprised Idi Amin in 2020. Is that his real name or is that's his name? Oh, Idi Amin wow. Fredos. Wow. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he should host Idi Amin. And the, the things that he was doing, he didn't see it coming. And that was the time that um, the fake awards came. Mm. Mr. Ewan. <laughs> Dr. Ewan. Dr. Ewan. Right. And so I remember I, I saw on Facebook he posted that since it's the season of awards. Let me also share my awards. <laughs> but I think, I think, especially as the original Idi I mean, we know has a very negative. But yeah. he is sanitizing the name. He He's has, giving the name. He has sanitized you know, a lot of positives in the uh, education to, space. In the educational space. He's doing so well. Uh, so, what is the plan? The Applaud Teacher Awards. What is the plan? What are you expecting to do this year? Okay. What support do you need? Hmm. So this year we are outside a car. We are going to the Eastern Region. Um, one of the areas we will go to is in Krakan. You know in Krakan? Is that Stakofoidia? In yeah. Krakan. In Krakan. In Krakan. Yes. And then we are going to Somanya. Um, we are going to just the point here. Okay. <laughs> so this year, we are in the Eastern region. So we started this, ma this month and then through to April. So the whole of April, Fridays, we will be Paying surprises, surprises to teachers in the How many are you targeting? How many can okay. we Okay, so um, so far, we've done over 100 for the previous years. This year, we are doing 42. Okay. So why 42? <laughs> and, and, and I'm curious, I, yes. I, 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 lest I forget, <laughs> um, do you target all the regions or is it that... A you, region you at do... a time. A region at a time. A region at a time. Right. So this year we are going to the Eastern region. But at the Outstanding Teacher Summit, there are some teachers randomly selected. that selected, does across Ghana, who will be appreciated on the day. But for a plot teacher especially this year, we are in the Eastern region. Okay. Yes, we are, going to, we are going to surprise the teachers. And we believe that the little that we do will encourage them to give more, to see the, the, the dream of Ghana, you know, transformed. The dream of Ghana transformed. What, what, one of the things uh, that breaks my heart has to do with, um, or the things that break my heart, has to do with schools under trees. Mm. And Is you remember that, the promises that were made? Yeah, even in Accra. 
right? And um, they are so rife. I mean, I cannot imagine for the life of me how you can expect that crawling youngster to make any sense of anything. Crawling on the floor, sometimes lying on their bellies, scrawling, scrawling on the bare floor, and expect them to compete with people from not Morning even staff. not even other jurisdictions, <laughs> right here in Ghana. Yeah. You know, the international school setup. We are basically setting them up for disaster, a disastrous future. And sometimes it comes back to bite us. But which entities would you like to salute, if any? And yeah. what, what kind of sponsorship do you need? What kind of help do you need? You can share that with us okay. and with our viewers. So we need, um, this year especially, in addition to presenting the teachers with the citations, we would love some teachers to get scholarships as well. And we believe that if the teachers get more knowledge, um, their effort is recognized by being enrolled physically in schools, it will motivate them. Um, we believe beyond giving gadgets and other things, the gadgets will spoil. But when you are able to impact knowledge, give back to the teacher to go and study and come back, then the transformation that we seek um, will happen. And so organizations should come in to support these teachers um, once we, we fish them out and then they gain admissions to go to school. They should come in to support them because um, some teachers go the extra mile and as they go the extra mile, if people recognize their efforts and also go the extra mile to support them to become better, then there will be change. So everybody should come on board, um, come and support us, come and support us with scholarships for the teachers, come and support us with money. Yeah, we need money to um, bring out more citations, money for transportation, because going to these areas is quite involving. Um, we have to use our own resources sometimes. My team, sometimes I'm on them. Some of the roads are terrible. Oh. Terrible, 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 terrible. But what, because we, it's a, it's a target, because it's a project that we want to do, we set out and we go the extra mile to do all these. So everybody should come on board. Um, our Momo lines are active. You can send in Momo. You can call us to let us know that you want to support at least one, two, three, four, five teachers um, for them to become better. Should I share the Momo line? Well, I guess you can go ahead. Okay. So you can um, send us your donation to 0249-886236. You, might, you might want to slow down on that. 0249-886236. Or you can do it through Etel Tigo, 026-13-41. 500 is on the screen. Um, call you know, there are those who uh, may have the volume on on their TV, but they're, they are not necessarily looking. Exactly. And that's why we do this for ah. them, so that if, if yeah. they want to, yeah. they can yeah. catch up. Yeah. Yeah. Any final words, Stella? Yes. Um, to the Ghana Education Service, Ministry of Education, um, all the other agencies, we know you are trying. National Teaching Council, we know you are giving your best. But we feel that there is more that can be done to make the teacher better. There is more that can be done to make the school environment more conducive. We are giving our best, but the best can be better based on the support that is being channeled. And so thank you um, to my team, special acknowledgement um, to our board chair for our plot teacher award, Dr. Ifua Boatima Yakuhine. She's been super. Her money goes in every year. <laughs> Um, to Divine Ellie Coffee, um, to PAG, everybody, everybody. I can't mention all the names. I might falter here. And so, and to my father, especially, Francis Efum Labi, uh, my husband, my children, and everybody. All of them, their money go inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes their home money. It, it go reach everybody. It go reach everybody. Yeah, we tax everybody. So. Yeah, yeah. And Echo, special thanks to you, eh? The way he, he's been super uh, supportive. Echo, you mean Derek Echo Sam? Yes. My, my producer your who, pro your produ who has a head like mine. Yes. <laughs> yes. Echo, Echo yeah, has please. been amazing for, for two years after winning 
the teacher of the year. He's been super supportive and we can't go without him. So we'll, we'll come through with our, our tax. You know, yeah. Tax. But um, as, as we end this conversation and um, you just brought to mind when we were talking about giving off your best. I don't know how well you remember your nursery rhymes because my mind went back to one of them. Do you remember? Shall we do this? Let's do, let's do this and see. <laughs> <laughs> let's do this. Let's go. Good, better, best. Oh, may I never rest until, until my, my good, good is better, better and my and better, my better best. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for breakfast. And of course, it's all about the Applaud Teacher Awards and Stella Jima Labi. Uh, she joined us for uh, breakfast. She's, of course, National Best Teacher 2022. Up next, right here on the AM show, we're going to be talking about a movie titled God is Near. Mm. I'm near to you too. Stay tuned. I'll be right back. Well, if you're enjoying that in the background, we'll let you enjoy the rest. Mensa Eyes But No Eyes. I think this is a fantastic song that is not getting too much airplay. We've done it here a lot of times. Listen to what he says. And get eyes, but then no they see.